Thinking Aloud, conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be exploring Tibetan Buddhist psychic traditions. My guest is Dr. Serena Roney Dougal. She's one of the rare people in the world who has a doctoral degree, a PhD, from an accredited university for doing a parapsychological dissertation. That was at the University of Surrey in the United Kingdom many years ago. She is the author of Where Science and Magic Meet, as well as The Fairy Faith, an Integration of Science with Spirit. Once again, this is an internet interview. Serena is in Glastonbury in the United Kingdom, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Serena. I'm delighted to be with you once again. Thank you very much, Jeff. It's a pleasure. We're going to be focusing in on uh, Tibetan Buddhist psychic traditions today. I know you spent six years working in India, and uh, to my understanding, not only did you work extensively with Tibetan Buddhists, both in India and, as I recall, in the UK, but uh, you also worked with uh, yoga teachers from the Vedic tradition. Yes, well, it started with the yogic tradition. Um a very nice sort of bit of synchronicity really there, um, which took me to India in that I'd been invited to give a talk and do a workshop in London for the College of Psychic Studies. And the talk was on the Friday evening and the workshop on the Sunday. So I had Saturday in London to kick my heels and decided to go to visit my former yoga teacher who had taught me whilst I was doing my PhD in London. And um, as always, she welcomed me in with cups of tea and plenty of chatter. And as I was leaving, she said, oh, by the way, that evening, the successor to the guru who started the ashram in India, um, whose um, yogic teachings were the foundation for, for her yoga school, he was going to be visiting that evening. And would I like to drop by? So I said, of course, and went off and got some fish and chips and came back that evening. And he gave what's called satsang, where there was some music and singing, and then he answered questions. And he was quite young, being the successor, and I sat in the corner and liked him. I thought he was good. And as I was leaving, I, by that time I'd written my book, Where Science and Magic Meet, and I had actually sent a copy to the ashram because Swami Satyananda, who founded the ashram, had been the one who had inspired my research into the pineal gland. And so as a thank you for his inspiration, I had sent a copy to the ashram. But I'd never given a copy to my yoga teacher. So as I was leaving and she was, you know, shaking hands to us all and saying goodbye one by one, I gave her a copy of the book. And she said, oh, Serena, come with me and led me into her living room where the new guru was sitting, arranging his transport on to Ireland, which is where he was going next. And she introduced me and he looked at me and he said, oh, my gosh, I've read your book. I really like your book. I'm setting up a yoga university at the ashram in India, and I would like you to come and teach parapsychology. So it's like it's an offer that I can't refuse, but I do refuse it because I tell him I've got a 13-year-old daughter at home. She's in the middle of her schooling, and there's no way I can leave her. And that I wouldn't be able to come for at least five years until she was 18 and had finished school. So he says, okay, we'll wait for you. And anyway, the university will be up and running and ready for you in five years' time. 
So I go back home to my very bolshy 13-year-old teenage daughter. You know, she's at the stage of slamming doors and I hate you, that period. And I say to her, by the way, when you're 18, I'm leaving home. At which point she says, there's no way. You're not allowed to do that, mum. You can't leave me behind. So I say, well, you'll just have to come to India with me. And so she did. When she was 18, they kept the position open for me at the university. And we flew off to India. And I started work teaching parapsychology at the ashram. Wasn't that just an amazing story? What a wonderful opportunity. A parapsychologist's dream, I would think. Yes, it really was a parapsychologist's dream. And they, they treated me like royalty. I had the best room in the guest house. Um, I was allowed to join any classes I wanted. So I was doing yoga at five o'clock every morning with the students and doing their meditation class just before lunch every day. And I was teaching the postgraduate students. Um, and I gave them just a basic introduction to parapsychology course. But because they were postgraduates, I wanted them to do practical as well as theory. So we would have a practical class every week. And I gave them various projects to do as their projects that they would go away and do. And one of the projects was something that in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, he says that when you attain to a certain stage of samadhi, that the psychic faculties come online, so to speak. Um, and I know that this inspired Honiton and his, his work led to the Gansfeld research. Um, so what we did was being in an ashram in India, I couldn't question whether Patanjali was right or not. Um, but what I could do was say, did the psychic abilities manifest only when you attain to a certain level of samadhi, of meditation attainment? Or is it a bit by bit process? As you do your practice year by year by year by year, do you see the psychic awareness, the psychic abilities gradually begin to develop? So that was the question we asked. Was it a all in one boom once you'd reached a certain threshold of meditation ability? Or was it a bit by bit process? So over so that year the students did it and I was really intrigued. So when I went back to teach the next year, I asked the guru if I could have permission to do this as research in my own right, working not just with the students, but with the students and with the swamis. Now swamis are monks and nuns who um, live in the ashram and they're most of the teachers in the ashram as well as other staff. And of course, they've been practicing for 30, 40 years, some of them. So we had the beginners in terms of the students right through to people who have been practicing for 30 or 40 years. So for the next two years, along with the help of somebody called Jez Fox, who designed a computer program called Precog, which is a basic free response design, but meant that it was all done on the computer, which meant that everything could be double blind and all the rest of it. Um, and it took us the two years to work out exactly what was the best way of doing it and how we were going to do. But we were gathering the data whilst we were doing that. Um, and then Jerry Solfin came on board to be the statistician to do, because I'm not a statistician, so he was helping with the design and the stats. And the results showed with, I mean, it, okay, it's very preliminary, all of this. It was it's pilot study level. But the results showed that we were talking about an incremental increase, a bit by bit increase in clarity of awareness as the years of practice of meditation happened so it wasn't to anything to do with the practice of the yoga asanas or the pranayama didn't seem to be anything to do with any of the other aspects 
Um, it seemed to be the daily practice of meditation that was the important aspect. Somewhere along the line, you also, in India, in encountered a variety of Tibetan Buddhist teachers, which is, a, I, I guess you have to say, a slightly different tradition than yoga. Okay. So this is another lovely story. So you've got to put up with my stories because, of course, my time <laughs> in India wasn't just doing the research and the teaching. Um, I would I would always go to India for a minimum of six to eight months, which meant that I had time out to do other things. And where the ashram was situated was on the banks of the River Ganges, with the associated temples and ghats were going to bathe and. One time I'd had an afternoon off and gone out with one of the students to bathe in the Ganges and go to visit the, the accompanying temple. And it inspired me that when I finished work that year that I was going to do a pilgrimage to the source of the River Ganges, bathing at all of the sacred places. So, you know, first of all, it was the train to Varanasi and I stayed there for a week, 10 days and found the right place to do the bathe and bathed in there and at the dawn and went to the temple and then I went on to the next place and so on. And I ended up, I mean, the travel story could take us hours, so I won't tell the travel story, but I actually ended up at the actual source of the Ganges, which is this glacier 4,000 meters up in the Himalayas where the stars are so close you feel you can reach out and pluck a star. Um, outrageous, amazing experience, and I would love to tell you the whole story. However, I got there, and I did it. And when I came back to Britain, I had taken loads of photographs, and lots of people wanted the full story. So I, I got all the photographs and put them all out on a display board, and several times told the story of my pilgrimage to the source of the River Ganges. And again and again, people would say to me, how are you going to follow this one, Serena? You know, it's a hard act to follow, walking on foot to the source of the River Ganges. It's, it's, it's something pretty mega. And finally, I came up with the answer, which was to meet the Dalai Lama. And people agreed that meeting the Dalai Lama was something suitable to follow, follow on from getting to the source of the Ganges. So the next year when I went back to India to, to teach at the ashram, I actually went a bit early because they had a, a five-day program, amazing five-day goddess worship program in another part of the ashram. And just after that, I discovered on the internet that the Dalai Lama was teaching in Darjeeling. And we were in, the, the ashrams located in, located in Bihar, and Bihar is just south of Darjeeling. So jumped on the train and off I went to Darjeeling and went to the four-day teachings of the Dalai Lama, which was so profound that it has affected the whole of my being. And then I went back to the ashram and I taught, and I then had a little bit of time at the end of my teaching before my visa ran out. So I went to Dharamsala. And uh, as it happened, the Dalai Lama wasn't in Dharamsala. He was in, in Canada doing Kalachakra teachings. But the monks in the monastery, the Dalai Lama's monastery, were actually making the Kalachakra Mandala in the monastery whilst the Dalai Lama was doing the teachings in Canada as a psychic support for the Dalai Lama, linking across from India to Canada. And whilst I was staying there and walking what is called Kora around the Dalai Lama's um, temple and watching this Kalachakra Mandala being made, of course, there's plenty other times to climb mountains and sit in cafes and meet people and chat and all the rest of it. And one evening I'd walked over to where there was this amazing waterfall and went into one of the cafes near there. And as always, groups of young people everywhere. And I went to get my food and somebody called me. And 
I looked to see who had called me and the person said, are you Serena? I went, yes. And they had come to a talk that I had given in England on a previous occasion. And they asked me to join them. So I joined them. They asked me what I was doing. And I told them about the research I was doing in the ashram. And one of them said, you should work with the Tibetan Buddhists. The Dalai Lama has asked for Westerners to do research into Tibet's psychic traditions. I knew nothing about this. And so he lent me the Dalai Lama's book, Freedom in Exile. In one of the chapters is called Magic and Mystery, in which he talks about Tibet psychic traditions and specifically says he wants Westerners to do research into it. So I read this book and a few days later I met the guy and, you know, went to give him the book back. And he said to me, well, what are you going to do about it? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, here you are doing research with the yogis. Why don't you extend this research to the Tibetan Buddhists. And I said, oh, no, you know, nobody would be interested. But he twisted my arm. So I went back to my room and got a bit of paper and wrote on it, dear Dalai Lama, you're my pin-up fab hero. I love you. And by the way, I'm doing this research. Would you be interested? Folded it up, put it in an envelope. And next time I walked Cora, I dropped it off at the secretary's office thought no more about it, got the plane home. Now, normally, mail from India to Britain would take weeks, if not a month or more. Within 10 days, I had a letter from the Dalai Lama's office in which they said, we don't have any research programs like this happening, but if you want to do it, you're welcome. All words to that effect. I... This, I think it was within 24 hours, it might have been a couple of days, I had an email from the ashram telling me that the government was suspending their postgraduate teaching program because of they'd had an inspection and their living facilities weren't considered up to standard, so they no longer needed me. Now, Jerry and I had already started putting in a, a grant request to Bial, the Portuguese foundation that fund parapsychology, asking for funding for the research I was doing at the ashram so that we could pay him and any other expenses that needed paying. So we went through this funding and everywhere that it said yogis, we put Tibetan Buddhist monks and just literally put the same research proposal into Bial that we'd been doing for the ashram, but we changed it. And Stanley Kripner, he helped. He wrote me a letter of support to go into Bial. I had the letter from the Dalai Lama's office that went in in support and blow me down. But Bial gave me three years funding, which enabled me to go back to India for the next three years to carry on the research program with the Tibetan Buddhists. That's r wonderful that uh, you got that far. But I'd like to talk a little bit about the uh, some of the dif differences between the Tibetan Buddhist traditions and, and the yogic uh, traditions. Uh, I'm under the impression, for example, that that the Tibetan Buddhists are much more influenced by uh, their indigenous shamans, the, the Bon religion, and uh, therefore very likely much more open to psychic functioning than than the yogic practitioners. Um, they're all, they're both open to psychic functioning. Um, in terms of the openness, there, there is no difference there. That's why I was invited to teach parapsychology at a yoga university, because the guru considered that whilst there might be pitfalls and difficulties regarding psychic functioning, it's better to know the pitfalls, to be aware of them, than to discard it completely. So in the yogic tantric tradition, um, psychic functioning is part and parcel of that whole tradition. 
The Tibetans, very interestingly, are very influenced by the northern yogic Indian tantric tradition. There's three strands to the Tibetan Buddhist traditions that I was working with. So you've got the Buddhist, uh, as, as per um, classical Buddhism, let's call it that way. Then you've got what you've just mentioned, the Bon shamanic practices, which are the historic traditional practices of the Tibetans. And then you've got this yogic tantric tradition. And I found so many correspondences between the tradition of the, um, the, 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 the Swami Satyananda Saraswati is the lineage of the ashram, the Saraswati lineage, and the Tibetan tantric teachings. It's like they were the same path. It was even to the extent that so I've just said Swami Satyananda Saraswati, the Saraswati lineage. Saraswati is the goddess of spring, the goddess of music, and the goddess of poetry and wisdom, that aspect. They have Saraswati in the Tibetan tradition. And their story is, is that Saraswati walked into a rock and turned out and came out as one of their protector deities, you know, one of these fierce deities with flames and big eyes and riding on an animal and skulls and everything. And she's a protector deity for the Dalai Lama specifically and for thereby Tibet as a whole. And she had been the goddess lineage of the ashram that I've been working in. So it was correspondences like this that I came across again and again and again. Um, and I found this absolutely fascinating. Now, I assume uh, that this Swami Satchidananda is not the same as, as the Swami Satchidananda who uh, had a big ashram in the United States. No, you're talking now Swami Sat Chit Ananda. I'm talking about Swami Sat Yananda. And Swami Sat Yananda, he had the ashram in Bihar and founded yoga schools across the world, you know, from Australia to Brazil, right, right across the world. Um, and there are obviously some in the States as well, but he was never big in the States. Um, and in Britain, anyway, the Bihar School of Yoga is, is quite renowned. It's very well respected in terms of the quality of the teachings. But it's the same lineage. So Sat Chittananda is also a Saraswati lineage. And the, the, the principal guru was Swami Shivananda. And Shivananda unusually had five major disciples of whom Sat Chittananda and Satyananda are two. Obviously, then, there's a, a lot of cross-fertilization amongst these groups and even cross-fertilization between the Buddhists and the Hindu yogis. Certainly with the Tibetans. So if we're talking the other strand of Buddhism, which you get in Sri Lanka and in Burma and in Vietnam, no, not at all. They don't have either the shamanic or the tantric aspects. It's only the Tibetan Buddhism that has this cross-fertilization with the Indian tantric yogic philosophy and practices. Well, one of the aspects of, of Tibetan Buddhism, which has always fascinated me, is the uh, use of oracles and the, and the fact that these oracles who practice uh, forms of divination are sanctioned by the state. They're official government oracles. Yes, yeah, so the Dalai Lama has several oracles himself, and you will find that most monasteries will have an oracle as part of, of the monastery. Um, and I was very fortunate. So my first year was spent in Dharamsala learning about Tibetan Buddhism. So for the whole of the first year, there was not one single Tibetan Buddhist monk who would do any of my research with me. And in fact, I came 
back to Britain saying, I'm not sure whether I'm going to get any research data, but I'm certainly learning about the, 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 the bodhisattva practice of patience because they kept me waiting that whole year. But during that year, I, I got myself a, a translator who was um, a student at the translator school in Dharamsala. So my translator um, took me to meet one of the Dalai Lama's oracles, an older woman, and I went with my translator and a monk. And the monk was from originally from Colombia, and one of his family had disappeared. And it was a time when there was a lot of war going on in Colombia, and he was very frightened that this family member had been taken by one of the guerrilla outfits. And she did a divination for him to find out for him whether or not his relation was safe. Um, so I actually watched her doing what is called a Mo divination. And in the Mo divination, what she did, so there's different forms of the Mo, and I saw three different forms being done. What she did was she got her mala. So a mala is a string of beads, 108 beads, that you use when you're doing your mantra practice. So she got her mala and she rubbed her mala between her hands and they always blow on it. The breath is considered very important. Um, and she she prayed to the Paldan Lama, that's the Paldan Lama, that's the protective deity who's not only the, the protective aspect of Saraswati and the Dalai Lama's deity, and the major deity for, for, for Tibet, but she's also the deity for divination. So she did the prayers to Paldan Lama. Um, and then what you do is, is you, you rub the mala between your hands and then at random you take two beads between thumb and forefinger of one hand and thumb and forefinger of another and you count them off in fours until you get to the final one, two, three, or four that are left. And according to what you get left will be the answer to the question. Uh, so it's, it's a classic divination method where you're using randomicity to help synchronicity provide the answer to what it is you want to know. Um, and she told him that his his relation was actually fine and not to worry. Now, unfortunately, I never got to see that monk again. So I never actually got to find out whether she was correct or not. However, for me, the interest was A, in meeting her and B, in actually seeing her doing a real life practice for somebody I'm under the impression, uh, in fact, from your writing about it, that the Dalai Lama himself relies on these oracles extensively. Uh, he has said on at least one occasion that they're always correct and, and that they were extremely helpful to him when he had to escape uh, from Tibet and uh, travel uh, to India without being uh, apprehended by the Chinese who had invaded. Uh, well, that's in his book, Freedom in Exile. So if anybody wants to read his story of his escape from Tibet, um, having used the information given to him by the oracles about the best time to leave and the best route to take. And not only did he use the information from the oracles, but he also followed the crows. So in Britain, we have a tradition that crows are magical birds connected with witchcraft and, and the, the fairy law we were talking about last time. Um, and they have the same tradition in Tibet, that crows are considered to be magical birds. And the crows help to lead the Dalai Lama on the route in such a way that he would never be caught by the Chinese who were trying to catch him whilst he was escaping. 
in addition to the oracles, uh, I gather both the yogis and the Tibetan Buddhists uh, talk about the siddhis, powers that are required, uh, not just the conventional parapsychological powers, but a wide range of other powers that are uh, acquired uh, through advanced meditation. Yes, so um, that is another tradition that is similar to both the yogis and the Tibetan Buddhists. Um, and, of course, there's lots and lots of stories. Um, if we think of Satya Sai Baba, um, there's multiple stories about Satya Sai Baba and his magical powers. The best story, if people want to read about this, would be Alexandra David Neal, who um, lived for a while in Tibet and became a nun in Tibet, and who practiced and attained to um, some of these powers herself. Well, there's also a very interesting book, uh, if I recall correctly, Erlander Haraldson, a parapsychologist, investigated the airports uh, that are attributed to Satya Sai Baba. Yes, so he investigated Satya Sai Baba, and Alexandra David Neal wrote about these magical experiences that she encountered with the Tibetans. My work with the Tibetans was just following on the research program that we did in the ashram that Jerry Solfin was helping me with, where we were using a basic free response design to see whether they were able to choose the correct picture out of a group of four. And whereas we were designing it in the ashram and it was very preliminary, I then worked for two years. That's so after the first year, they let me loose with the, the monks. They sent me to a monastery in the south of India, um, which had 4,000 monks. And I had a translator who introduced me to people and allowed me to do research with them. And I also traveled up to Ladakh, um, which was a most incredible experience, living and working in Ladakh, high up in the Himalayas, in remote mountain valleys. Um, and my research there showed very, very clearly that the answer to the question that we were posing, was it something that just came all of a sudden or was it a bit by bit change in clarity of awareness as you did your practice? And we found the second was, was the case in all three experiments that we did. In other words, the uh, uh, more time a person spent practicing, the better uh, their scores were? So for the first 10 or 15 years, you don't really see much going on. It's, it's sort of chance noise, so to speak. Um, but after about 10 or 15 years of regular meditation practice, we found that the scoring went up and up and up. And those people who'd been practicing 30, 40 years, they were very high scorers indeed, individually significant in their own right. There was a report many years ago by uh, David Reed Barker, who was uh, studying uh, with the Tibetans. And uh, if I recall correctly, he indicated they don't even have a word in their language for psychic functioning because they, they consider everything to be psychic. That wasn't what I found. They use a word called mungshe, um, and they actually have about 23 words for the different sorts of mungshe, different sorts of psychic functioning. Um, they, they're very clear on one particular aspect. They consider that there is what one might call the native-born psychic functioning. Um, like, for instance, one of the um, oracles who I met who had a, a, a sort of a, a fit while she was waiting in line to see the Dalai Lama, um, and she the Dalai Lama said, take her and we look after and we train her because she was a natural uh, medium. So 
I worked with um, somebody also down near the monastery in South India who, who practiced the Mo divination, and she had it in her family. So she, there were seven generations of them who had all done the Mo divination. It was considered a natural ability of her family. So they, 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 re, they, they understand this aspect of Mungshe, the, 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 the natural born, but they consider it quite unreliable. So a natural born psychic, now you see it, now you don't. And we know that from the West. So if you go to see a clairvoyant or a tarot reader, it might be a good day and you'll get something very clear. It might be a bad day. Then there's the other sort. And this is the sort that is trained. And this is the sort that the Dalai Lama and other high lamas are considered to have. And they are considered to be 100% reliable all the time. Well, one of the fascinating things to me about the whole Tibetan culture is uh, it's such an extensive monastic culture, and they have, uh, I suppose at this point, the, the experience probably of millions of monks over many, many centuries, and, and the training goes on decade after decade. Uh, it, I don't think we have anything quite comparable in the West to the Tibetan monastic tradition. Yeah, so I lived in the monastery down in South India for two years. Um, and they had 4,000 monks there. Um, most of them were young. So the youngest was about four. They've all come out from Tibet for the training. Some of them go back to Tibet, but very few. Most of them, once they're out of Tibet, stay out. Um, and the youngest of about four, so that was somebody who was considered to be a Rinpoche that they had discovered and found and brought out from Tibet. A, a Rinpoche meaning a, a reborn uh, Lama? A reborn enlightened person, yes. So the training goes, so I, my translator was actually the English teacher at the school. So these young boys are all at school until the age of about 18. And then they start their geshe training. And the geshe training can take up to about 20 years. So they are training one way or another until they're in their 30s, maybe into their 40s. And most of the monks that I worked with were post-school, but doing their geshe training. Um, and then I did work as with some of the, the, the older monks who, you know, had already acquired all the, all the training that they needed to acquire and had become the teachers, as well as I had the fortune of working with three Rinpoches as well. Um, and they are amazing places. So for me as a woman and for me as a Westerner, I lived in the monastery, but in the guest house of the monastery. And so there were only about four or five women with the 4,000 men. So um, at one point, I thought of writing a book about it uh, entitled The Only Woman with 4,000 Unavailable Young Men. <laughs> but that book won't get written. However, it, it would be fascinating to document all the experiences that I had during that time of living and working in that monastery. Now, I uh, understand from your writing about it that uh, in, in the Tibetan tradition, they recognize a number of hazards associated with psychic functioning. Oh, I mean, in every tradition, they recognize the hazards. So the yogic tradition of India recognizes the hazards the British tradition of witchcraft recognizes the hazards, um, and the Tibetan traditions also recognize the hazards. Um, when we're working outside of time and space, which is what we're doing when we're working with the psychic, then we have to be very, very, very careful about our own egos, so we 
we must not allow our egos to get inflated in any way. We need to stay humble. We need to stay very down to earth. And in fact, most of the problems that we see in the West with people who claim to be great gurus or great teachers or great psychics or clairvoyants, what we're dealing with is a problem of, of ego. So, you know, that is first and foremost of the hazards that can come about when one is working in this area. There are obviously others, but that's that's the best one to talk about, to warn people um, that they need to step very carefully and need to stay very humble. W would you say that the uh, recognition of the hazards is uh, equivalent in these different cultures, that they basically you know, see things the same way? Yes, Absolutely. Because they're very obvious psychological, emotional, psychic and spiritual hazards that anybody who sets foot on this particular path of training themselves to be consciously psychic at will, as opposed to the person who is psychic just because they had a dream, they didn't want to do it at will. But, you know, if the Dalai Lama is asked to do something he will prepare himself, he will get himself into the right state of mind, and he will then do what is asked. Um, and it, it's that preparation that helps to make sure that you, you, you don't come a cropper with the various hazards that there are. I uh, imagine in the case of the Dalai Lama, if, if he's going to participate in uh, an oracle or, or something of that sort, there's a very elaborate uh, ritual involved with extensive preparation and a great deal of concentrated mental focus. Yes. Yeah, so one of the um, monks that I was going to work with, um, and sadly in the end, this was up in Ladakh, um, and sadly, in the end, circumstances didn't allow me to work with him. But he was actually going to prepare himself for three days before taking part in the research. Um, they have a, a, a lake in Tibet, which is the lake that they go to when they want to find the new Dalai Lama. And the practice is to look into the lake and you will see the picture of where the new Dalai Lama has been born. And that sort of practice, they will have prepared for weeks to have got themselves into the right mental, psychic, emotional state of consciousness to make sure that the picture that comes through is really clear and not being affected by anybody's ego in any way. As I recall from your um, paper on uh, the Tibetan psychic traditions, one, uh, a couple of the issues they talk about are dangers associated with sorcery and, and the idea that uh, ghosts, there are unfriendly ghosts who will try to interfere uh, with people's lives. Yes, the Tibetans have that, that belief, and we also have that belief here in Britain. And it's just the same as in ordinary everyday life, actually. There's people who come from good motives and doing good things, and there are people who come from bad motives and doing bad things. And when we're very young, we have not got the experience to be able to discern whether something is coming from a good heart or whether something is coming from somebody who is out to get whatever they can for themselves and they don't give a damn about anyone else. And it's just the same in the psychic realms. I have heard people uh, 
express the belief that as you evolve in your paranormal abilities, you also become more spiritual. And uh, I think what I'm hearing you say is that those two uh, dimensions are uh, what we might say orthogonal to each other or not correlated. You can be highly evolved in the psychic domain, but not in the spiritual domain. Absolutely. And that tends to be somebody who is born with a natural gift and who does not get the proper training in their own moral development. And so this is why the Tibetans distinguish between the two sorts of mungshe, the two sorts of psychic ability, the natural one that you're born with and the trained one that you get when you develop to enlightenment. And so they're very wary of the natural born psychic because the natural born psychic has not had the moral training to make sure that they are humble enough to only use their abilities for the good and the benefit of all beings. Um, and the monk I was work the Rinpoche I was working with in the monastery in the south, he was very dismissive of the natural oracles and mediums who I was interviewing because they hadn't had that training. And so there was a problem that whatever they might tell would be clouded by their own ego because, of course, one's own ego can cloud anything. And, and, and it's the highly trained monks, Rinpoches, up to the level of Dalai Lama who have managed to deal with all of their ego problems and, and that aspect of the psyche that you can rely on what they say 100%. Whereas the natural born, there might be too many other things coming in that cause all the problems. You know, it seems as if what you have there in Tibet is a kind of mixture of this monastic society, which has a, a particular hierarchy based on training and even based on recognition of uh, attainments uh, from past lifetimes. Uh, but it's also, in some sense, a, a feudal society where the uh, uh, higher monks are almost the equivalent of, uh, you know, feudal dukes and barons. Uh, of, uh, let's say, medieval times in Europe? Uh, it certainly was before the Chinese invasion. It was a feudal society. It was a highly hierarchical and patriarchal society. Women had a status that was barely above that of the yaks. Um, and even the nunneries in India, the women were treated absolutely appallingly. We could feel, from a Western point of view, that um, the that aspect of Tibetan culture is, is something that needs to change, and the Dalai Lama himself has talked about it and has now started giving nuns the same status as the monks. Um, so we're not talking about uh, a highly enlightened culture. The culture was that of nomadic people who still had their shamanic roots and in many ways was a highly problematic culture. Um, but what we are talking about is a culture where there was this very developed spiritual aspect of the few, but mainly by the men. So in general, the enlightened ones were considered to be men, that women couldn't attain to enlightenment. So from a Western perspective, there were lots and lots and lots of problems with the Tibetan culture prior to the Chinese invasion. Um, certainly the Tibetan culture in India has been transformed and the Dalai Lama will readily acknowledge that prior to the Chinese invasion, there were many problems with this highly patriarchal culture in Tibet. Um, we can't say that the Tibetans are all roses. No, no, no. Many, many thorns as well. 
One of the things that Tibetan Buddhists are particularly known for is the Tibetan Book of the Dead and their appreciation for uh, the afterlife. I think uh, many people, I would tend to assume myself, that the Tibetans have a deeper understanding of the bardo planes of the afterlife realms than uh, other forms of Buddhism or maybe many other cultures. Did, was that your experience? Did you encounter any of that? Yes, I did. I, I did encounter that. Um, I encountered it in various different ways. So one of the things we have to recognize is that in Tibet, there are the four main sects of, of Tibetan Buddhism. Um, and the Dalai Lama's sect are the Yellow Hat sect. Um, now, they don't really think too highly of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. The Tibetan Book of the Dead comes from the, the earliest sect of all, the Nyingma sect. Um, and they are the, 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 the red hats. When you see the prayers being done for the dead, um, and the belief in the bardos is there for all the sects, yes. They all have that belief in the bardos. Um, and they all consider that what we are doing in this life is a preparation for death, so that when we die, we will have a consciousness that is clear enough not to get trapped in various different ways, but to be able to go through clearly to the white light, to the next birth with full consciousness. And that's what a Rinpoche is. A Rinpoche is somebody who has trained their consciousness to the point that they can stay conscious through death. And one of the Rinpoches I talked with in Ladakh, a young Rinpoche, he had memories of that between life period when he was flying around looking for who would be his mother for his next life. And it was really fascinating interviewing him. So there's aspects of the Tibetan Book of the Dead which are common to all the different sects, but essentially it's it's a Nyingma practice, that one, as opposed to any of the, the other sects, although some of the beliefs are, are held in common. Now, I know the oracles in Tibet deal with, uh, typically they become possessed by the deities, uh, which has always struck me as a, a, a little paradoxical because in, in Buddhism, uh, my, they have this philosophy of anatta. There is no self. So ultimately, I have to assume they don't believe the deities are, are really you know, permanent transcendent beings. They're in some way no different than us. Okay. So what we've got here with the deities is this mixture of the shamanic aspect with the Buddhist aspect. Yeah. So the Tibetan deities come from the traditional bond shamanic thread. We, if we see it as a plat with the different threads, the Buddhist, the tantric, and the shamanic, yeah, so we've got this thread, and they're woven together. Um, and so like the protected deities, they are very much from the shamanic realm, and that's what we're talking about. Then we've got the tantric, like the Saraswati deity. And that tantric aspect comes from, they, they use a lot of the Hindu deities within the tantric aspect of Tibet. And then you've got the Buddhist thing, which says that all of that is just phenomenal and imaginary and illusion, and we need to go beyond all of that. Um, so. It's a very, very interesting philosophy that is actually threading together different ways of understanding the world to be, build up the whole picture. And do they also integrate into it uh, uh, something akin to Western spiritualism, where they have uh, contact and communication with the, their deceased uh, relatives or ancestors? Well, remember the Tibetans consider that after 49 days you're going to be reborn. So the contact with the deceased ancestors is actually through the newborn. 
um, and the hungry ghosts, and which you mentioned earlier, to be feared, are those who, for whatever reason, haven't been able to transition through to being reborn. And that's why, that's why they're feared in the way that they're feared, because they've got stuck. They've got stuck in a particular stage and haven't been able to do the transition through. And that's why the Tibetans will do the prayers for the 49 days, because that 49-day period is the period when you're going through the bardos from this life through to the, your, your next life where you are reborn. So reincarnation is an incredibly important part of the Tibetan belief system. And it's, it's an evolutionary thing. One is considered to be evolving life after life, evolving in terms of your consciousness. So it's the consciousness that threads through from one life to another. Here in the West, you find amongst channelers uh, spirit guides who are supposedly humans who lived in, in other uh, remote periods of time, maybe an Egyptian high priest or uh, an alchemist from the Middle Ages will, uh, will manifest as a spirit guide through a medium or a channeler. Uh, I, from what I gather from what you're saying, you don't have that uh, in uh, the Tibetan culture. No, in the Tibetan culture, the mediums are the oracles. So the Tibetan word for oracle is actually medium, and they mediate the divine. So every oracle is actually possessed by a divine being, by one of these divinities. So, um, the, the, you know, if you look at the name of the particular oracle, that is actually the name of the divinity that is using that human being as their channel. Uh, so it's a very different system from what we have here in the West. So what you, we're getting at now are some very distinct cultural differences that manifest in, in the way these uh, psychic functions express themselves in these cultures. Yes, um, there are similarities so when I was talking about the Mo divination before, where they were using the mala to divine, that's very similar to a lot of, of Western practices, where let's say we will shuffle a tarot pack or something like that. Um, but in terms of our understanding of mediums and that aspect, then it's very different because in the Tibetan the medium, the oracle, is imbued with a divine spirit rather than the spirit of the dead. In all of this time you spent uh, living in the monastery and teaching at the ashram, your own meditation practice must have uh, deepened quite a bit. Absolutely life-changing. Is, is there anything else you can say about it? <laughs> um, so when I went to India I was doing my morning practice I've been doing my morning practice for about 40 years now um, but it was a morning practice that was very much within the yogic practice in and of itself when I had that initial teaching from the Dalai Lama in Darjeeling, he did a what is called a Bodhisattva initiation. Um, and I, I took that very seriously. And so on the wall behind me, you won't be able to see it, but I've got written out from one of the monks I worked with in the monastery in, in southern India, the um, what are called the parameters or the perfections of a bodhisattva. And I am working on those. I, I consider that they are an important part of life. And as part of my yoga practice now in the morning, I include, as part of my meditation, 
um, the Tibetan practice whereby you think of, of, of a close friend and maybe they've got problems and you become aware of their problem and you send out whatever the appropriate healing or positive would be to help that person. You then think of uh, somebody who you're acquainted with, do the same thing, and then somebody who you really don't get on with, whatever might be a trouble for them, you become aware of that and send out the positive. So I've incorporated that practice, which is a Tibetan practice, into the end of my, my meditation. Um, it's called bodhicitta practice. And, and so whilst I still have my basic yoga practice as my daily morning and evening practices, um, the Tibetan teachings, the Tibetan philosophy, um, and this particular bodhisattva practice have become incredibly important in my everyday life. You're sending positive healing thoughts to someone you're close with, to somebody who uh, you're barely acquainted with, and, and to somebody who you might even consider uh, hostile. Absolutely. Um, and the the hostile, the, the example that the Dalai Lama gave was for him the Chinese, because uh, they've, been, they've destroyed the Tibetan culture and, and nation, and you can think of nothing more hostile than that. And so he would send them this loving compassion, this bodhicitta, to, to the Chinese as part of his daily practice. Well, that is incredibly profound. Uh, what an important lesson. Serena Roney Dougal, I want to thank you so much for sharing your years of experience uh, working in these very profound uh, and intense spiritual cultures and uh, how wonderful that you were able to do parapsychology research in, in that environment. Serena, thank you so much for being with me. And thank you so much for asking me all these wonderful questions and taking me to remember those most profound and life-changing experiences that I had. Thank you. And for those of you watching, thank you for being with us.